So um, heading into our, our first session of the day, I'm gonna invite Corey Clatterbuck up to the podium. Um, you're welcome to hang out here, grab the red mic. Um, Corey's gonna talk about kind of big picture vision for some landscape assessment tools and good work done and incorporating biological data there. So, and then you can advance here and do your thing. Sounds good. Good morning, folks. Uh, thank you so much for introdu introducing me, Allie. And um, like she said, my name is Corey Clatterbuck, pronouns are she, her. And I'm going out a little bit out of my comfort zone with a typical scientific talk to talk a little bit more about the history and work that many people at the Water Board and at partnering agencies have done to advance this landscape assessment tool for California um, and hopefully using that to advance watershed protection. So why would the water boards be interested in a landscape assessment tool in the first place? And that really starts with our mission, which is to preserve, enhance, and restore the quality of California's water resources and drinking water. And this really mirrors section 101A, also of the Federal Clean Water Act, which is restore and maintain the nation's waters. And at the water boards, we spend a lot of staff time and resources on this restore part, um, meaning we identify impairments in streams and then we integrate some program resources in order to address those particular impairments. Um, those could be the TMDL program or the non-point source program. And one area that we have considerably fewer resources towards or plans towards is this preserve portion. And if we're going to fulfill our mission, we need to start devoting some more resources towards identifying healthy watersheds and high quality waters in California, and then implementing protection ideas to keep them that way. And one way in order to do that is through watershed health assessment. So watershed health assessments are essentially compilations of ecological data that um, can tell us something about um, watershed health. They're consistent across the area of study. Um, and so uh, using watershed assessment, we say ecological data, that could really be anything. Um, but thankfully, US EPA has provided six attributes of healthy watersheds that we can use to base watershed assessment from. And I won't go through these individually today, but what I want you all to notice is that all of these variables can um, differ across scales of time and space. And we know that you know chemical, physical, biological processes also vary across time and space, and those can impact aquatic uh, structure and function. And so incorporating these uh, attributes are really important in watershed health. So once you incorporate these attributes into assessment, typically, or at least in the past, they've been put in white papers or reports. And if you're wondering if California has one, we sure do. Uh, it is the Integrated Assessment of Watershed Health. Um, it was published in 2013. And uh, it was mainly through work of US EPA, contracted out to the Cadmus Group with the um, review of many people here in this room today. And one of the main outcomes of this report was an iterative framework that we can use to continue to update uh, our assessment of watershed health as new data becomes available. And that framework is as follows. Uh, first of all, you can gather all the data. So what this framework did was gather uh, indica indicator variables from data sets for all, at the time, like 124K reach catchments in California. It's a lot of reach catchments here. Um, and then for data that we didn't have any monitoring data for, for instance, there was some predictive modeling done to try and fill that in. Uh, this particular assessment used boosted regression trees in order to do that. Um, and then you also have to standardize the data. So all of the variables in each reach catchment uh, were, ranked from, uh, were ranked from highest to lowest and then standardized between zero and one. And then those variables were compiled into three different indices and those indices are really as follows. So first you have watershed condition, which is essentially like your large landscape size variables, talking about how much the watershed has changed from some point uh, in the past. 
And then the second index is stream health, which is the current physical, biological, chemical condition of in-stream health. And so those two indices together, watershed condition and stream health, really make up what we consider watershed health like at the current time. And then the third index is watershed vulnerability. And this basically takes into account current water use, temperature uh, changes, you know, fire severity, all of that to figure out how much a watershed is at risk of degrading in the future. And so once those indices are compiled, guess what? You get some pretty maps. Um, so here we have two of the indices I just went over on the left is stream health and on the right is watershed vulnerability. Unfortunately, the color scales are different here, but high stream health is in blue and then low stream health is in yellow. And then high watershed vulnerability is a pinky purple color and then low vulnerability is more of the yellow color as well. In the upper right of each panel are the different indicator variables that were compiled to make uh, each index. And I do want to note, of course, that for stream health, there were no uh, values available for the MODOC and the desert regions. Essentially, the modeling wasn't strong enough in order to say, yes, this is definitely, um, we could compare it to the rest of California. And so these indices indicate what you might expect, right? So you have lower stream health in yellow in the Central Valley and in urban areas. And you also have low vulnerability, for instance, Colorado River and Mojave Deserts. So what you can do with these two indices in order to figure out areas to protect is look for areas of high stream health and also high vulnerability to maximize your protection. And so the authors found that the Lake Tahoe area, area of high stream health at the time, and then also an area of high watershed vulnerability. So they suggested this was an area that would be worth enabling some protection actions. So, as I said, this was published in 2013 um, in a paper, and um, while static maps are great, we have this iterative framework in order to continue updating um, these, uh, this assessment. And as we know, the best way to continue updating assessments is probably not in a report, but in something that we can access at the time um, so that we're making sure we're always getting the most available data. And people through the Healthy Watersheds Partnership, which is a working group of watershed professionals, anyone from the public who's interested, um, can come to our meetings and meet quarterly um, to talk about you know, updating this assessment. And one particular member, Lance Lay, who is a engineer at Regional Board One for the Water Boards, decided that he wanted to take this idea further and make a prototype dashboard for um, watershed health in California. And I've left the links up there. You're free to take a picture if you would like to visit the dashboard yourself. I'm not going to talk about all of the features in this prototype here, but I do want to go over a couple. First, it's using a uh, open source tool and platform. So it's built using our Shiny. Uh, that's really important for us at the water boards as the state is moving towards more open data initiatives. And also, we can, use, we can enable reproducibility as we have staff come in and out of the program. We want to make sure that the tool is really easily updated. Uh, secondly, this particular dashboard does use data and scale from the 2013 assessment that I just went over, and it also only focuses on the Russian River watershed because that's uh, what Lance was interested in. And it has a couple of other features that I'm going to go over at this time. So, Shuka, if you could start that video. Oh, bye, Shuka. <laughs> She's not there. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm in this watershed metrics view, and uh, here you can see the index for watershed condition and the six variables that make up watershed condition. You could also select a different index if you so chose. And then down there, you could also um, select in individual indicators if you wanted to view those as well. But here I'm just choosing the definitions from the watershed assessment report and calculating. And then here is a map of the Russian River watershed area. I'm changing uh, the colors to kind of mirror what I showed you before. So yellow is low and this purple is going to be high. And again, this is watershed condition only for Russian River area. And you can see it's pretty patchy. Um, however, if I chose a different sub-index, for instance, land cover vulnerability, so the tendency for land cover to change, 
uh, you can see that we do actually see some patterns here where in the Santa Rosa area, more urban areas, there's less vulnerability to change uh, compared to the upper watershed. And then the last view that is available in this dashboard is viewing the data that's involved. So you have each row and is it's tidy data, if you're familiar with R, so each row is an individual reach catchment. So this was a super cool prototype for Lance to put out. We were really happy um, that he was able to do that, but there are some additional features that the Healthy Watersheds Partnership really wanted to add on. And I'm going to present those in the same kind of framework uh, as the 2013 assessment. So first of all, we wanted to have this user-selected scope. So not just looking at reach catchments, but also potentially um, HUX as well, uh, user extent as well. So the original assessment was statewide only, but maybe you wanted to look at relative values within a water board region, for instance. Um, so that way we could adapt the assessment to really fit water managers' needs. Also wanted to standardize and weight data. Say you're more interested in CSCI and want that to drive an index that you could make from this assessment. Um, so you could weight that higher than other indicators such as nitrate or, some, or any of the other um, ones that you're interested in. And then lastly, you could visualize and download the data. So you not only can view the map, but you can download the map itself and also the associated data that you either created or any of the defaults that were in there. And if you look at this plan, like I looked at this plan when I joined the water boards, it's pretty ambitious. Uh, it's pretty ambitious for a group of people who are largely volunteers to say, yes, we're going to go ahead and build this really important dashboard that we need for watershed protection. So what I did was reach out to other groups that have completed such assessments in other states or other regions and was basically like, what did you do and how did you do it? And two that have been really inspirational to me in these last couple of months are uh, Wisconsin and Chesapeake Bay region. The Chesapeake Bay region includes like seven or eight different states that are all invested in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And from talking with Pamela and Renee, they've been so giving of their time and so inspirational. Um, we really realized two things but that we needed to do before moving forward. Uh, first, that these meaningful visualization tools take a lot of resource investment. They had multiple people working on tools at the same time. Uh, secondly, the assessments uh, really took place within these larger protection aims and strategies. And while we have, we're excited about this tool use, what we're really missing, at least at the water boards, is this piece of protection strategy. We don't have one um, separate from those that are embedded, for instance, in TMDLs. So uh, earlier this year, Allie Dunn and I decided to take a step back from holding quarterly meetings of the Healthy Watersheds Partnership in order to develop this internal integrated water protection strategy uh, for uh, healthy watersheds and high quality waters here in California and at the water boards. And what that means for us is, first of all, kind of getting our ducks in a row at the water boards first. So trying to find people at the water boards who are also really passionate about protecting waters and investing resources in order to do so. So not only at the swamp program, but also at the regional water boards and the division of water quality are people that we've reached out to currently. If you're in the room and you're with water rights or any other group, of course, we would welcome your input as well. Together with water boards and all of our partner agencies, uh, we want to form a multi-agency TAC that can then inform a three-pronged protection strategy. First, a strategic framework, and then a action plan for how we're actually going to enable the framework. And then, of course, the dashboard that I've just laid out for you all. So I, lastly, I just want to point out that the strategic planning portion really completes the cycle of what at least UP, US EPA had in mind for not only are you identifying healthy watersheds and high quality waters, but you're also implementing those watershed protection strategies. And then you can actually measure how well you did. So that's what we're trying to do here. And with that, I'll go ahead and take any questions.
Uh, thanks for that presentation. I have a question about the framework itself. Um, when you assess vulnerability, how much of that is based on sort of predictions of where you think landscape change might occur versus are you going to actual like land use plans and general plans of different counties and and what kind of source of data are you using for that and how do you update those as you move forward? Yeah, good question. I think what was used in the 2013 assessment was, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the agency that did it, but it was another California agency that releases these same figures. So we weren't developing these indicators, the individual indicators by themselves. They were coming from an internal, um, from one of the agencies. I wish I could remember which one, but it's, a, it's evading me right now. I believe the, the range included in that vulnerability was through either 2050 or 2080. So. Whenever. Yeah, was, no, vulnerability would also be a part of that uh, landscape dashboard that we, we hope to incorporate. So, you know, with all of our open data initiatives here within the state, trying to pull in that data via an API occasionally would be the goal. For the vulnerability and habitat assessment, what data is easiest or hardest to get a hold of? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I would actually say that some of the data that I've had problems getting, a lot of the data that we've used in this reassessment is actually through Streamcat, which is really nice. It's a really easy data set to work with. Um, but there are some indicators that were basically homegrown through toolboxes from the Nature Conservancy and that kind of thing. So being able to redevelop those, I think, have, have been the hardest ones to do. Hi, thanks. Uh, great presentation. I really like the way that you have uh, kind of knitted everything together from back in the 2013 uh, report to current time. Um, I was involved back in the day. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, you were one of the people um, in that assessment, for sure. Yeah, yeah, so I, it, and it's great to see everything, you know, moving towards um, a statewide <clears throat> water board policy and with the end result being a, you know, a, a interactive dashboard. Um, I'm kind of curious, like, once you get there, um, there are a lot of, filters that you can use when you're doing your assessments, right? So have you thought about coming up with a way to determine, okay, so from, I work in the integrated report, I identify impaired water bodies. So how, what filters would I use to determine that, okay, this water body is impaired or this water body is in good condition? And somehow documenting that through the process? Yeah, so. I think, um... I think I see the visualization tool as more of a complement to what the integrated report does. So um, instead of saying, like, we could definitely predict whether or not this water body is impaired, we could kind of pair the integrated report with watershed assessment to say that these are the kinds of things that we could do in, the, in these individual reaches. And actually, um, I think Eric Stein's work is going to answer your question <laughs> for a, a lot of that because um, his work is at a smaller scale than the statewide scale that this assessment was looking at. Uh, yeah, so thanks for the talk. Um, so I was wondering, um, a lot of the time the, you know, the 303D listings are based on small data sets for a specific parameter. And I was wondering if you ever got a disagreement between something being listed as impaired versus scoring well in terms of watershed or stream health. Yeah, um, I guess I would have to ask Lori a little bit more whether this report has been actually been used to inform the integrated report. Um, but I actually haven't looked at that particular comparison, but I would say based on my work with the integrated report so far and looking at this assessment, I would not be surprised because this, I, although we're looking at the reach catchment scale, you're looking at broad patterns. We're not looking at these individual reaches that the integrated re report really looks at. And so you're going to see some disconnect just based on that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I 
Uh, maybe you thought of this already, but um, I was thinking that putting out to any partners who might be collecting data, like what format you want the data in, so it's, then it's easy whatever is produced in the future to then automatically have it incorporate and flow easily. Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of the um, current monitoring data that we use is from the SWAMP program and from CDIN. So if you're using any of those you know, data input formats with SWAMP IQ, that's exactly the format that we're looking for. Um, and we can, you know, change, you know, adjust and transform values and all of that kind of stuff. So um, the rest of the assessment, at least in 2013, was um, a lot of landscape level variables that were already in data sets that we didn't have to put together from CDIN. Um, but I would say, you know, since we're doing this landscape dashboard um, and we're really renovating it, I hope to like really be useful for a lot of people at the water boards and um, anyone involved in watershed protection. Um, any of that is kind of up for debate still. So I hate to say like we're definitely doing it this way when we haven't formed the TAC and decided exactly how we're going to do it. I'm wondering if you can comment on if this is being used or planned to be used in the governor's 30 by 30 participation? <laughs> um, I don't have an informative comment on that <laughs> question. Um, I would leave that to Allie. Great question. Um, so that's a tricky one. I know from um, Cali PA perspective, it's um, water was kind of left out of the 30 by 30 initiative. So that's not to say that's going to stop us working with folks like we've worked with the um, I'm spacing on the agency name right now, but um, some more conservancy agencies that are involved in that. And just, I think we can do that collaboration with folks that are more connected, um, but there's no like formal integration of this plan into 30 by 30. I hope that helps. <laughs> Thanks, Corey, that was great. Um, I have a question about the 2013 uh, assessment report, if there's any intention to kind of repeat or revisit that. Uh, I think the question uh, that was posed earlier of whether there's consistency or inconsistency with the actual 303D impairments in um, some of the areas that the, the report perhaps suggests uh, are in good condition, maybe uh, in conflict perhaps with some of the persistent impairments in those parts of the region or of the state. Yeah. Um... I think so dealing with scale is something that we're going to have to deal with in terms of what the water boards wants this particular dashboard to look at. Um, in terms of revisiting, um, the authors were really clear in the statewide assessment that it, everything was to be looked at at broad scale rather than the reach scale individually. But there is, and Eric Stein and I have talked about this, um, the need to ground truth a lot of the data that would that we would produce from the dashboard. And so involving the integrated report in that process would be part of it as well. Those are such good questions. Thank you all so much. All right, so uh, next up is Eric Stein. Um, I think these questions were coming up, but often when we talk about these broad scale assessments and looking at patterns, the more reach scale stuff comes up, like what do we do? Is there a decision support framework of types of management actions or additional monitoring? And so Eric is gonna talk about some work underway that he's done there. Go ahead and click it there. Thanks, Allie. Weren't you gonna read? No, I Good. think I'll do, I'll okay, do this. I'm not going to do Dr. Oz and walk around the audience today. Thanks. And so Corey's uh, talking. Can you guys hear me in the back? Ted, can you hear me? All right. Um, so Corey's talk was a great setup for what I'm going to talk about now. And so this is work that was funded by US EPA under a Section 104 grant. And the timing is fortuitous. And I hope what you see, there's sort of three things out of this I hope you see. One, this work hopefully supports the framework that Corey talked about. We've been working closely with the Healthy Watersheds Partnership. 
Second, I think it'll also demonstrate how we use our bioassessment data in sort of new and different ways to help support some of these management um, decisions we're making. And then third, hopefully, as we talked about yesterday and as Corey mentioned, this desire to do more on the protection and restoration side than just trying to fix problems, which we want to do, but we want to protect the healthy places, and hopefully this will support some of that as well. So those are sort of the three things that hopefully this project will demonstrate. All right, so I don't need to sort of beat the dead horse on this. We need a strategy for, um, you know, we have a lot to do in the state. We have a lot of streams that need attention. And so, you know, how do we help prioritize with the limited resources that we have, what we do and, and where we do it? Um, and so Corey uh, gave you a really great overview of this 2013 assessment. So I won't go through that again, except to say that, you know, as we talked about, this was at a sort of a bro uh, more of a core scale, right? And so we looked at the HUC-12 scale and made these assessments at sort of these HUC-12 areas. And so what we really need to do to support this framework that Corey talked about that the Healthy Watersheds Partnership has developed a process around is develop a tool that allows us to tunnel down a little bit more and look at the reach scale, the NHD reach scale, and sort of make some more informed planning decisions about what to do at that reach scale so we can hopefully, again, prioritize our resources well and, and move towards healthy watersheds. So the thing that's important to, to recognize with all these tools is that they're planning tools, right? So they're coarse, there's a lot of model data that go into them, so it's sort of like the first step of the planning process that allows you to then go in and kind of focus in your more intensive work where it's most needed. So keep in mind when we go through this that these are all sort of designed to be used at the planning level, not at the regulatory level. They're not designed to identify you know, where you want to do a TMDL or things like that. All right, so the general approach that we use, and I'll go into this in more detail, is we look at condition and stress or vulnerability, very much the way Corey laid it out. Um, that and then what we did here is try to use those two together to inform specific actions that you might take at the NHD reach scale, as Ali was talking about. And then we layered in a couple of other things, recognizing that there's a lot of existing watershed plans out there through IRWMs and other things like that. We want to be, have a, a framework that accounts for that. And also we brought in to bring in some environmental justice or try to begin looking at environmental justice issues. And all, overall, all those things together can lead to some strategies for managing at the watershed scale. All right, so we have a four-step process, and I'm going to walk through each of these four steps in turn. Um, but this is kind of the roadmap for the process, um, kind of our decision framework in a sense. So it starts with condition assessment, and we're using CSCI, ASCI, and two of the CRAM attributes, the California Rapid Assessment Method, physical structure and biotic structure, because those are focused more on what's going on within the stream itself. So we use those condition, uh, those four condition indices to sort of bin streams broadly into intact or degraded, and I'll, I'll tell you how we did that. And then on the intact side, then we start to look at stressors again to see if the, are they intact and under stress, meaning they might be vulnerable and we might want to do some risk reduction, or are they intact with low stress when they're maybe that's those, those are your candidates for protection. Um, and then on the degraded side, similarly, we also look at stress and we use that to identify are they degraded but don't have a lot of stressors, so maybe that's more of a monitoring and a protection um, uh, setting. Or um, are they subject to restoration or management? And if so, which, which, sh which should we prioritize and what action should we prioritize? So we try to sort of step through this process and then at the end of step four, do this prioritization based on local watershed plans and environmental justice considerations. So I'll walk through each of those just briefly. I'll tell you how we did it. So again, condition, you hopefully you're all familiar with our, our statewide condition indices. We're fortunate that we have a very high data density in these um, areas around the state. But as all of you know in this room, right, when we do our bioassessment, we you know, go to, it's a, largely a probabilistic program. We go to specific locations, we collect data. And so in every watershed in the state, we have lots of stream reaches that are unmonitored. And so one of our first questions is, how do we take the data that we have through our monitoring programs and kind of extrapolate that across the drainage network to be able to bin every NHD reach into sort of this intact or degraded category? So of course, as we all know, that's where models come in. And so in our case, we used uh, random forest modeling. Um, so similar type of approach to the boosted regression tree that Corey talked about. And so in this random forest model, we were able to take the, the wealth of data that we have at, at sites where we actually have observations, leverage a lot of the GIS data that we have through sources like StreamCAD and other things like that, and develop a, a predictive model that can 
predict what we think the ASCI and CSCI and the two CRAM attributes might be at those unmonitored reaches. And so it allows you to produce a map that looks like this. And so again, keep in mind this is modeled data, right? So, um, and so what we can do is start to bin you know, every reach into these different categories based on the predicted or the modeled CSCI, ASCI, and the two CRAM attributes. I'm not going to show you the maps for the two CRAM just in the interest of time, but they look somewhat similar. So now we have these maps that we can look at where we have these predicted values across the drainage network. So the next question is then, so now you have four scores, what do you do? Because we still want to get everything binned into either intact or degraded. So we used an approach um, similar to the stream quality index. Some of you have probably heard Rafi talk about stream quality index at previous CABW meetings. But basically what we do is, in this case, if any one of those four indicators um, was the scores were within, you know, below that 10th percentile of the reference distribution, which is what we typically use as a threshold to define intact versus degraded. If it sort of failed in any one of the four indicators, we called it degraded. So we're trying to be, in a sense, conservative. If you fail any one indicator, we call it degraded. So now we have a way, so we apply that, that sort of filter across the drainage network, and so now we can bin all the streams into intact or degraded based on whether or not they failed one of those four indicators. So the next step is then to start to look at the stressors and figure out, are there significant stressors acting on those, and if so, what do we do about it? So for stress and vulnerability, we use the well um, talked about and much appreciated StreamCat data set uh, that has been developed by US EPA. So we looked at over 140,000 stream reaches in California and pulled all the StreamCat data associated with each of those reaches at the reach catchment scale, very much the same way Corey talked about. And so then we need to, the next step is now we have all the stressor data, we have to sort of define a threshold for the stress, like so how much, you know, what, uh, what level of stress is, is sort of tip you into a problem versus not a problem. So again, the way we decided to do this, and this was in a lot of consultation with the Healthy Watersheds Partnership and our Project TAC, is uh, what we did is for every one of those stressors, we just regressed those stressors for all of these 140,000 reaches against the predicted condition scores that we had for CSCI, ASCI, and CRAM. So what those look like is they look something like this. And so this is um, an example for one of those stressors. This is road stream intersections, which is one of the stream cat stressors. And on the right, I have regressing that against the ASCI and the left against the CSCI. And so we've done, we all are probably familiar with the CSCI. Our threshold is typically 0.79. That's our 10th percentile of the reference distribution. So we say, okay, at a 0.79, that is associated with 0.8 intersections per square kilometer. That's kind of, so that becomes our stressor threshold for that stressor and that condition indicator. For the ASCI, it's a different threshold, it's 0.21. So what this graph tells us that at that 0.21 road intersections per square kilometer, that's typically kind of associated with the point where we, the ASCI falls below that 10th percentile, the reference distribution. So we can do this for all the stressor condition combinations, and we get a big messy table that looks like this. Um, and so what you can see is for each of the major stressors that we identified and each of the major condition indicators, we have different threshold values. There are some blanks because in some cases there wasn't a good association between that stressor and that condition indicator. So again, the next question we have is how do you then synthesize this across you know, all these different thresholds to come up with one way to bin these things into different categories? So again, looking at our road stream intersection example, we explored three different ways. And again, we had a lot of discussions with the partnership and our TAC, and so we looked at, do we do the most sensitive threshold? Do we do the kind of preponderance of evidence? Or do we do the median? So we settled on the median, and that was largely because as a planning tool, we want this to have good discriminatory power. So in other words, if everything winds up in one category, it doesn't do us a lot of good. So when we sort of tested all these different options, the median threshold gave us the kind of best ability to discriminate and sort of put things into different categories. So, and it's, you know, it's just as good as the any other one. So, so that one worked the best for us, so we used the median threshold. So now we have a way to assess condition and put things in sort of intact and degraded, and we have a way to determine whether we have substantial amounts of stress that we think are affecting condition. So now we have to sort of put it all together and say, how do we use all of that information to make some recommendations about the priorities and, and what we should do with all of this? 
So this, this last messy table that I'm going to show you, and this is sort of a pure BPJ, best professional judgment table. So what we did is we sat down again with our TAC and our Healthy Watersheds Partnerships and said, okay, let's put our heads together. And for the major stressors, we said, okay, is this stressor typically something that would trigger a, a restoration action or a management action? And then we actually tried to identify very specific things, like what would you do? Would you do runoff control? Would you um, enhance the buffers? Would you do uh, restore breaks and stream continuity? So we really tried to come up with kind of a list of very specific actions that typically would be appropriate given that type of stressor. And so we created kind of this matrix, which then got um, attributed uh, against all of those stream reaches. So um, I'm going to walk you through this. I know it's a little hard to see because the, the, it's small relative to the screen size. But this is how it all sort of goes together. And this is one of our pilot watersheds. Um, this is the San Juan watershed in Southern California. So the first step on this condition side is we went through that process, and the green are the intact streams, and the red are the degraded streams. So that's the first step is we can create those, that sort of binning. And then the next step is for the green, the intact ones, we went through that kind of stressor kind of checklist evaluation and said, where do we have stressors that are sort of exceed those threat, those, that median threshold that we established? And so then we're able to identify in those intact ones that we, where they have high levels of stress and therefore should be candidates for what we call risk reduction. So some sort of intervention because they're intact, they're high stress, we want to do an intervention to sort of keep them intact versus ones that are intact but have low stress and are probably just better candidates for just protection and monitoring. And then the, the middle and lower ones, kind of the same process, except these are focusing now on the red streams, which were the ones that were degraded. And we can go through that same process and identify, um, are they candidates for restoration or management, high, you know, high priority for restoration or management, because they have stressors that have exceeded those, those, that median threshold that we established. And then we can put it all together into an integrated map, and we can start to sort of then stay at the NHD reach scale, um, what should we be doing in each of those reaches. And then the last piece, that sort of last messy table I told you that had specific actions, we can go ahead and at each of those reaches, we can attribute them and sort of go in and say, based on the specific stressors that were acting on that reach, what are the management actions that we determine might be appropriate for consideration at that level? And um, in some cases, you can see streams are candidates for both restoration and management because they had multiple stressors acting on them that triggered um, different, different um, priorities. So this is kind of how you put it all together. And then we can put together this whole map, and we can start to attribute things at the statewide scale. I'll give you a link at the end. The, geo, the geodatabase is in, uh, built in ArcGIS online, and it's available. Um, I think, Corey, you guys already have it as part of um, the work that you're doing. But what you can do then is you can click on each of these reaches, and it'll give you the attributes for that reach. So it'll tell you what the C predicted CSCI and ASCI, what, you know, what categories it came in what the stressors that are acting on that reach are, and what are the management actions that are associated with those stressors. So you can click on different reaches around the state and get that information for each reach. So the last piece that I'll go through is then how do we incorporate these local watershed priorities? Because we know there's a lot of things happening at the local level, and we want to be able to leverage those things that are happening at the local level. So we demonstrated this in six pilot watersheds on the central coast and southern coast, uh, south coast, which you can see here. And so for environmental justice, we use the Cal Enviro screen data set um, that hopefully most of you are familiar with. It's um, produced by the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, OEHA. And it basically is, it works at the census track level. So there's a little bit of spatial disconnect there, but um, we can work with that. And it has two sort of categories of attributes as population characteristics and then what they call pollution burden. And I'm showing you the metrics here that go into each of those. We focus on the pollution burden. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is these aren't necessarily associated with streams necessarily. It just means that those census tracts have a disproportionately high pollution burden on the communities that live in those areas. And so we decided to use the 20th percentile. So we took the areas within the census tracts with the sort of highest 20th percentile of pollution burden. We said those are the communities that are most impacted by the pollution in general. And so that allowed us then to go into the watershed and say within those watersheds, if you wanted to prioritize areas based on this pollution burden and some of these environmental justice concerns, these are areas you might further prioritize and look at. And so we can have the first tier looking at stress and the second um, tier looking at considering the, the environmental justice concerns. 
And then finally, where we have local watershed plans, again, in the San Juan, we have um, an existing NCCP, which is the Natural Communities Conservation Planning for Sensitive and Endangered Species, and that's identified certain areas that um, are important for protection of least spells vireo, and so we can begin to overlay those. And so in the end, we can put all of these pieces together, and hopefully at a planning level, it can help us begin to think about where we might want to protect, where we might want to reduce risk, where we might want to do investigations for um, developing more detailed restoration and management actions, and kind of use these maps to inform form that deeper planning process. So that's kind of the sort of whirlwind tour through the tool that, again, working with the Healthy Watersheds Partnership will um, hopefully feed into the overall framework that they've been developing. Um, we can then hopefully support that as well as local efforts. Like in Southern California, we have the Wetland Recovery Project, which is trying to prioritize stream reaches for, for funding, for restoration, and so we can hopefully support all these planning efforts. So I think these slides are going to be made available. Allie, is that right? But um, if you, again, take a picture, if the slides are posted, I have the links here so you can um, access the code. So all of the code for the models is available on our GitHub. Um, you can you know, get the GIS layers. You can um, interact with the map, or you can download the, the, um, the shape files and the, the, themselves and, and take them into whatever application you're doing and hopefully use them. So that's, and this is the report that's available on our website. Did I do it? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Eric, I didn't quite follow how sites were uh, prioritized for restoration. You mentioned that there were 28% that were sort of highlighted for, for restoration was, were those the most degraded sites? Yeah, so, so right, yeah, so I kind of breezed over that, Chuck. So what we did is we took, we went through that filtering process, so to be um, prioritized for restoration, it had to first be um, degraded, and then it had to exceed thresholds on the, on the stressors that we had identified. Um, and so it was sort of the most degraded sites with sort of the most exceedances of those, those stressors, the stress thresholds that we identified. Okay, so my question is, does it make sense to prioritize the most degraded sites for restoration rather than moderately degraded because you might get more success out of restoring moderately degraded sites than really heavily degraded ones? That is an excellent question, and I think... Um, I think there's an argument that could be made, you know, for both. Do you want to go to the worst places and try to fix them, or the places that are kind of on the on the cusp? And so, um, I think that becomes a management decision. This is the way sort of we, you know, bend it in the decision, you know, tree that we develop. But I think you could easily go in and use the exact the data that's already there and and re, you know, decide how to bend them differently, right? So you could say, well. I'm not going to take the most stressed. I'm going to take maybe the, the median stress values and, and prioritize those. So I think that could easily be um, explored as another option. But great question. Ted? Yeah, when you were um, sort of extrapolating the stream condition um, values to the stream network scale at mm -hmm. the, on, at, in the first phase, the watershed stressor information was sort of embedded in those models, right? right? And I'm just curious if you were able to sort of take advantage of things like variable importance plots to actually think about which stressors are actually explaining the degraded, you know, biotic conditions. Because it seems like in this framework, you're sort of treating the stressors in the second phase somewhat independently of, of that, even though there's some information there about the nature of the relationship between the stressors and the biotic indices that, that could be in, actually informative for the types of actions that might be most effective. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. And there's, so there's two, two things in there that I would comment on. And so you're exactly right. And we actually did that. I just didn't show it in the interest of time. So there's probably two important things to keep in mind that there is not independence, right? Because we're using some of the same types of data to in, in the random forest model as we are in the stressor evaluation. So we tried to be cognizant of that, a little bit of that circularity and, and tease that apart a little bit. And we did. I showed you um, some of the stressors on the table, and obviously that's just a subset of the stressors that we have in StreamCat. And so 
the way we selected those high priority stressors were based on the variable importance analysis that came out of the random forest modeling. And that's how we sort of culled that larger list down to the ones that we felt were the ones we needed to focus on. But I just didn't show that. Um, and I also didn't show the performance of the model. I, had a, I took it out for time, but the, I can tell you the R values are sort of in the 0 0.5, 0 0.55 range. So as we'd expect, I mean, they're not horrible, but they're what you might expect on a statewide model, which I know you know a lot about. <laughs> so. Thank you, really interesting. Yeah. I have a question on when integrating uh, restoration and management actions, uh, to what extent do you consider the dependency across reaches and the fact that some restoration actions may propagate downstream, thinking about yeah. pro regime restoration and, and, or others, and some may have a very localized right. um, benefit? That's a great question, Albert. And so, so Albert's question really has to do, and this is something we tried to do, and I, I think we couldn't solve this problem. Um, so it's clearly these reaches are not operating independently as, as a, what's behind your question, right? And so what you do upstream is obviously going to affect what's downstream. And so there's lots of things to consider. It's that upstream to downstream effect or even the spatial context. Like if you have a bunch of degraded reaches or if you have a bunch of intact reaches and a degraded one in the middle, maybe that becomes a high priority because you can restore that continuity. So there's a lot of spatial interactions that are important. And we actually had a lot of conversation about how to do that in an automated way. Like, could we mod create rule sets or model that? And so we tried uh, you know, to create some spatial rules that we could um, uh, sort of code into the analysis so it could be done in an automated fashion. And we just we couldn't solve that. We couldn't come up with something that we felt work to our satisfaction at the state scale in an automated manner within the time and budget constraints we were working in. So it's a great question. We talked a lot about it, but I think we just couldn't solve that problem. And um, hopefully, maybe as a next phase, you know, there's some more work that can be done to deal with those really important spatial issues. So. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. That was great. I need like a week to absorb what you <laughs> just told us. Um, for the modeling exercise uh, that used the statewide ASCI and CSCI, and I think you said CRAM mm -hmm. and um, one other. It's so, just the two CRAM, two of the four CRAM attributes. Yeah. Um, thinking about it from North Coast uh, specific bias, obviously. From the north coast we have a lot of fisheries that we're particularly focused on the model output for the non-monitored um, stream reaches sort of suggested that conditions looked good and yet from a cell monitored perspective we have threatened and endangered species that we're trying to hang on to there's a lot of focus on the physical habitat attributes um, of those conditions in those reaches do you feel that the models are adequately and accurately representing conditions relative to some of the other types of beneficial uses in particular that we're really you know, keen and focused on aside from benthic macroinvertebrates, algae? You know, are we sensitive enough? Are we using all the right tools? I guess that's my, my question and what I'm kind of focused right. on. Right, so I think the simple answer is no. Um, so, because again, it's, it, as you rightfully point out, it's a statewide model. It's based on the bioassessment indicators we have. I didn't show the, the map for CRAM, but if you look at the CRAM physical, the model for the CRAM physical attribute, I, um, it would probably show a little bit more of what you're talking about because it's going to be sensitive to some of those in-stream kind of physical perturbations that may be more critical from a salmonid perspective. But it's also, but it's limited by what we measure in, you know, using those tools. So um, the bioassessment tools and CRAM is a fairly coarse level, you know, uh, condition assessment tool. So it's not, I don't think they're going to be sensitive to some of the things that you're particularly concerned about um, on, in the North Coast from the Salmonid. I, but I, what I would say is that I think the approach, if we had um, data sets, like maybe it's, you know, flow data or um, fish passage barrier data or other things like that, um, the same type of approach could be used so we could build in, like, for example, another condition, another um, kind of element in the condition assessment 
if we had the data that was was required to to spin up a model even at a at a regional level. So I think the framework could be adapted to accommodate that, but the way it is now, I think it's going to miss some of those other beneficial use considerations um, just by nature of the the data sets that we used. <laughs> uh, just you get uh, one more, you have to buy me a beer. Okay. All right. Next year. <laughs> okay. Um, I, uh, the index of physical integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts on it? Um, what we can do with it? How we can expand? You know, build it out similar to the CSCI. Like I'm amazed by the CSCI um, and its usefulness and application. I feel like we're lacking still on the physical habitat aspect of our bioassessment. Do you have any thoughts on where we might go, any recommendations, um, any projections? Yeah, um, and I don't, I'm looking at Rafi because I know he has a lot as well, but <laughs> or Andy in the back. Um, so I think, I think we don't use, I th first of all, I think the, developing the IPI was a good step forward in helping us use the physical habitat data that we spend a lot of time collecting, and so at least getting an index developed, I think, was a huge step forward. Um, I think we, in my opinion, we probably don't make as good use of it as we probably should. Um, in this case, we specifically didn't use the IPI because we were focused on developing the ability to bin things based on condition, and the IPI is, tends to be a little bit more of, in my opinion, a little more tuned to stress than condition. And so that's why we didn't use it as part of the condition assessment. But I do think there's a lot of data that could be um, mined from the, the PHAB data sets to help inform and you know, provide insights. And I think Rafi might talk a little bit about some of that during the modified channels stuff. But um, I don't know. I would let Andy or Rafi comment as well, because I think Andy's probably got the most thoughts on this or thought the most about it. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan, for that loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. So, I mean, honestly, since we're all here talking, if I had to do that physical habitat index over again, I'd do it differently. Um, we've learned a lot over the last few years about its performance. Uh, there's a lot of things we scratch our heads about um, in terms of how it's performed over time. It seems to be pretty forgiving. I don't think we tap into our physical habitat data adequately. Um, like Eric said, that, that index was kind of a first attempt. Um, I'd like another shot to do it over. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Um, so I think I, I don't really have a question, more of a comment. Okay. Um, so. At the beginning of the presentation, you said, you know, this isn't for regulatory purposes and it's for planning purposes. So I just, I see a lot of value in this. Um, and you said something to the effect of um, it's not choosing for to do TMDLs or something like that. Yeah. But I just wanted, from a San Diego Water Board perspective, um, it really, it, TMDLs for us are a planning mm -hmm. process. So everyone thinks TMDL, they think of the Basin planning, regulatory TMDL, but there's a lot of TMDL alternatives that we use, including things like, you know, funding some restoration action. So um, I just wanted to you know, kind of comment on how we would expect it to be used in a planning process, which to us is where and what type of TMDL or other restoration type of action to do. No, I think that's a great comment. And as you know, we've worked a lot on this. And so, um, yeah, no, I think that's a great comment. I think. My caveat was sort of reflective of some of the earlier questions that Corey got about, you know, how this can be used in concert with more um, specific, site-specific data. But what I would say, and going back to Ali's um, comment and stuff we're doing with you, right, in your region is, I think if these types of tools can be really helpful in starting to think about where we want to protect or where we want to do risk reduction in higher quality water bodies to try to keep them in higher quality, right? So. Thanks, Eric. 
Um, great discussion, everybody. And we're going to scooch on to Rafi. We're kind of eating into your time. So we can eat into break or however we need to, to adjust things. Um, and I did want to say there was a question um, from Nick Schulte, which basically, Chad, you got at it. Just how does this feed into regulatory action? So um, Nick, hopefully that answered your question. And Rafi, you are ready to go. Thank you. Uh, so after hearing Corey and Eric talk about protecting our, our best dreams in California, I'm going to talk about what some might consider our worst dreams. But they're still important, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but I, would, I, I mentioned this yesterday, that one of the greatest um, obstacles to using our bioassessment data is that we often don't know how um, our plans that integrate, that use biointegrity, how they'll play out in modified channels. There's a lot of concern about that among stakeholders. So we really need some, some basic information to address these concerns. So first, I'm going to say the reason why we like bioassessment as a tool to understand the health of, of ecosystems is that they're so good at integrating all the different stressors that affect a stream. It's really the primary advantage of bioassessment. The challenge is that in, in modified channels, you might have um, some, some stressors that are so overwhelming that you can't really see the impacts of some of the other stressors. And so you're not going to be able to tell if your water quality improvement projects are working well. You, it's harder to assess that in a modified channel. So the State Water Board and the Central Valley Regional Board, uh, they've, really, they've begun a new study to really look at biointegrity and also biostimulatory conditions in modified channels. Uh, the reason is that we, we often need to have different conversations about how we're going to manage modified channels, what kind of timelines apply, um, what are the appropriate goals for these types of systems. Um, the fact is that a lot of these uh, modifications are there for a purpose, and those purposes aren't going away anytime soon. So in light of you know, um, uh, major changes in the way we move water around the state, the modifications are likely to stay. So when we have classes of modified streams to under, understand how we're going to have these conversations, there's a couple ways we can use this information. So this is just a little bit of a cartoon of some data where we have a measure of biointegrity like the California Stream Condition Index. We have different classes of modified streams. And we see that you know, there might be one channel like this class one here on the left. Point, I'll just point the old fashioned way. Uh, <laughs> You know, it might not ever, uh, we might not ever observe it to attain high scores. And so maybe there's some kind of constraints associated with this class that prevents it from reaching that. In contrast, class two, you know, they're typically scoring poorly, but they do have high scores with some regularity. So you might have different timelines for these two classes of modified systems. You also might want to look at how the stressors um, affect biological integrity. For example, you might have, um, again, this. Class one stream, the responses are really muted. Um, so you, know, um, you might not be able to see how a stressor like total nitrogen affects condition or, or changes in total nitrogen affect condition so well in one class versus another. Again, you need different approaches for handling these streams. So we really need a way to identify what kind of stream is in class one versus class two. So there's been a number of studies on this topic already, uh, primarily in Southern California and the Bay Area. Um, we've really started to learn a couple of common lessons. We, we see that, yes, biointegrity scores are, are substantially lower in modified channels versus unmodified. Um, we are understanding that hard bottom streams tend to have the most um, ex uh, severe constraints, whereas uh, soft bottom modified channels have a very wide range of, of conditions. Um, and we, again, see that most of them have a fairly muted response to stressors. But we're also learning how context matters. And sometimes context is more important than modification. Now, in Southern California, we've really seen this in anecdotal fashion. That photo shows a very high scoring hard bottom channel, uh, but it's so unusual. It's way up in the mountains with almost no uh, alteration in the landscape. Um, and you know, in these rare circumstances, a hard bottom channel can score just fine. Uh, it was looked at a little bit more thoroughly in the Bay Area, where um, this graph here shows um, the, the effect of impervious surfaces um, as that increases on, on biointegrity scores. And if you look at that red line, you see that um, that's hardened channels. Um, below about 20%, it, it shows an increase of conditions. So you do see that imperviousness does, in fact, matter, that low impervious hard bottom channels score better than those with high imperviousness in the watershed. So we've identified a number of approaches to um, 
to classify and modify channels. And I'll talk about these three in a bit, but basically we're looking at whether they have uh, traditional versus ambiguous watersheds. We're looking at a, a system proposed for the Central Valley in the Inland Surface Water Plan of 1992. And finally, we're looking at classifications based on bed and bank material. So there are some streams, particularly in the Central Valley, where you really can't identify a, a watershed that contributes flow to a, sample, a sampled uh, location. Typically, but not always, these are constructed ditches, and there's no real connection to the headwaters. They're always in areas of low topographic relief, and we're gonna try to evaluate these as a class by themselves. This is what I call, like, you know it when you see it. This is typically like a, a, a ditch along a agricultural field um, that, that isn't um, a historically natural channel. The vast majority, so I've looked at a, thousands of sites at this point across the state of California where we've collected bioassessment data, and this situation occurs throughout the Central Valley. A small number also appear in the Imperial Valley, but I haven't found any in other parts of the state. And now, they probably do exist everywhere, but it, I just think that they haven't been sampled in, in most of the other regions. And it's actually possible that in, in most of the time, these aren't what nor we would normally consider to be sampleable. Just to give you an idea of what they look like, uh, that's a photo of one from the Central Valley. You know, sure, yeah, you, you, you could figure out how to collect bugs from that, but most of them look like that. You know, they typically don't have water in them when you go to there, uh, when they're not under active, you know, irrigation. So um, it's kind of remarkable to me that we have sampled as many of these as we have. <laughs> Okay, so the um, Central Valley Inland Surface Water Plan, it was proposed in 1992, it was modified in 2007, but it's never been formally adopted. Uh, it's based on this flow chart. Um, the public was asked to provide the regional board with information about different streams in their regions uh, to apply this flow chart and figure out how streams should be classified. A lot of it's based on things like whether the, the surrounding area is primarily agricultural, whether it's got return flows or, or supply water, whether there's been extensive realignment, whether it's historically a natural channel. And you end up being classified as natural, ag-dominated, or this third class, what they call constructed or naturally, or naturally dry channels. They have subtypes based on whether it's return flows or, or supply water or a mixture of both. The third class I'm looking at is bed and bank material. This is what was used primarily by the Stormwater Monitoring Coalition in Southern California, as well as in the Bay Area. We can infer bed and bank material from a large number of sources, including GIS data, aerial imagery, site photos, or, and even I'm looking at, looking at uh, physical habitat data to try to get better use of that information. And there's a, a wide range of uh, classes that we can get out of this. And I've hinted at some of the bigger ones already, but basically whether the, there's a hard bottom channel, a soft bottom channel with no hardening, one hardened bank, or two hardened banks. Um, typically, uh, GIS asset shapefiles from stormwater or flood control agencies, these are a really great source uh, where they're available. Uh, you don't have consistent information across jurisdictions uh, or even within a jurisdiction, and that classification may not be consistent with your classification approach. In this case, for Sacramento County, it actually works out really well. Uh, but even in this case, you're, you're sort of left to wonder, there's a, the southern part of the county uh, has uh, no coverage in the shapefile, so you're kind of left to guess as to what those channels are made of. That's, that's one of the, the bigger limitations of this data source. Photos are actually a really good data source, and they are sometimes really uh, easy to interpret, like in these two cases. Um, I've got a bunch of photos from, from ABL. They have great uh, library of photos and it was possible to t figure out what the channels looked like based on just uh, examining these photos pretty quickly. But it's not always that easy to interpret. You can't see, for example, what the bottom of the stream looks like. Um, you don't know uh, whether it's hard bottom or soft bottom, whether it's low flow, so it can be a little bit uh, challenging to use this by itself. So because of that, we've actually conducted a large number of, of site visits to different parts of the state in the, uh, the central coast, uh, and the Central Valley, uh, the Region 2 has actually uh, contributed to this effort a lot in the Bay Area. So now we have over 100 additional sites where we've basically classified according to bed and bank material. The Stormwater Monitoring Coalition has been actually also doing this as part of its survey uh, for several years now, so we have hundreds of sites in that part of the state. Um, if you guys are actually interested in contributing some of your data to these efforts, uh, you can just um, access our Survey123 app, uh, it's a, you can use it either a mobile phone or your, um, or do it on the desktop 
website, it's pretty easy. You're basically saying, what does the stream bed bottom look like? What, does the, what do the banks look like? What are they made out of? If your site, if you give this a site that's in Seeden, we'll be able to access that data and incorporate it into our analyses. I'm also looking at physical habitat data. This is a little bit trickier because we don't explicitly ask these kinds of questions when we do PHAB assessments, but there's a lot of useful information. Uh, we look at pebble counts, and that can tell us, you know, are they hitting concrete on the bottom of the channel? That gives us an idea if the channel bed has been hardened. Um, looking at the banks is a little bit trickier, um, and I can't say I've been all that successful with this, but I was able to look at some measures of human influence um, and see if there's things like walls and riprap noted on the channel, on the banks or in the channel, buildings, um, bridges and abutments, that's the third one that I've circled there. So I was able to say, like, you know, if that's occurring in the channel or on the bank, I can assume that there's been hardening. And I can even say, you know, um, how many banks have been hardened and uh, uh, to what extent. Um, again, how are we going to use these classes? And I'll show you some results for all of these. Um, we're going to, I try to identify classes where there appear to be some constraints. And so here are the results. First thing I want you to see, uh, we don't have any algae data from those ambiguous watershed sites, uh, but we do have data for almost all the other categories. I'm circling in red the classes that I would consider to be fairly well constrained or high likelihood of constraint. Um, you just don't see high index scores in these classes. So we have ambiguous watersheds for the CSCI, we have constructed channels for the CSCI, and we have most classes of bed and bank modification for the CSCI. When you look at the ASCII, it's clear that the soft bottom channels are, are fairly well constrained, but it's actually a little bit more ambiguous for hard bottom channels. Uh, these classes that I'm circling in purple here have a lot more wider range of scores. I'm gonna talk about some of these, these odd factors. First of all, we see high CSCI scores in soft bottom channels with one hardened bank. What's going on there? Well, it's possible that this type of modification occurs more often in natural systems, like up in, in mountains where you're trying to predict a, a road, but you don't really need to protect what's going on on the other side. Or it could just be simply that the fact that the river has more room to move can produce the habitat that generates supports high CSCI scores. The more confusing situation is what's going on with high ASCII scores in hard bottom channels. And I, you know, you look at a photo like this, it's sort of a head scratcher. Um, but there are possible explanations that we need to look at more thoroughly. One is that it's possibly responding to water quality treatments that have actually improved conditions in this channel. Or it could just be that they have a, a general preference for hard substrate. Um, or maybe there's, there's flushing flows that sort of keep the community from accumulating a lot of tolerant taxa. Um, so we don't, we don't really know at this point why, why this is the case. But this is something we've seen consistently, that hard bottom channels can at times support high algae index scores. Uh, just quickly, I'm going to talk about how I looked at responses. This next graph is going to be a little bit of a mess, but I'll just want you to focus on what, we, what we're trying to see here. It's, it's all these different stressors related to biostimulation in, in all these different classes of streams. And what you see is that you, you really want to see that these, it, these slopes go down. At least one index shows a negative response in that class, and that shows you that you have at least some way of assessing water quality improvements in that class. And we actually see across the board um, you know, you do see negative slopes most of the time in the top left. All three of them are particularly the algal index, ASCII H, is going down the most steep. Uh, sometimes you have more surprising results, like second from the bottom on the left, you see that the CSCI appears to have a positive relationship with total nitrogen. It's, sometimes it's, it's um, you know, driven by just um, a lack of data distribution along the stressor gradient, so it's gonna be hard to model these things. But you do want to see that across the board, you do have at least some negative relationships for the class you're looking at. So like I said, we're right now preparing a, a, a decision framework to help select biointegrity and biostimulatory indicators for assessing modified channels. Um, the SMC is actually about to start a new study that I know some of you already are involved in to trying to find ways to improve conditions in modified channels, focusing on ways you can uh, improve conditions within existing channel forms as well as ways to restore natural channel forms. And like I said, if you'd like to contribute to, to some of the analysis, please go ahead and use that Survey123 app. And I'd just like to finish with a message that this really is an environmental justice question. Uh, modified channels are probably the most conspicuous parts of the landscape that people interact with on a daily basis. And it's really our choice in how we manage them in terms of whether they're gonna be a blight op for communities or an amenity. And so I really think it's something that we deserves a lot more attention. Thank you.
And we have time for questions. We'll just bump into a break and move everything five minutes forward. I'm, I'm really interested in the work that you're doing with F SMC to um, figure out ways to improve channels. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that or just how can we learn more information? Well, it is at its very beginning stages right now. Um, we're assembling a work group, um, which is a handful of folks in the room who are actually part of that work group. But yeah, our goal is really to figure out what is going to, we're not, we're not trying to characterize you know, how bad things are. We're trying to see what types of interventions will actually have an impact. We're not even at this point sure of exactly how we're gonna do that. It's perhaps gonna be a number of case studies, could even be some manipulation. There's gonna be a mixture of new data collection and evaluating existing data. But it's gonna largely be um, done through our existing survey um, in terms of the data that we collect. But yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So did you look at any of this with the modified channels and compare it with some of the stuff we talked about yesterday with the intermittent or the um, ephemeral, you know, how often that they have water in them? You talked about flushing a little bit, but can you elaborate? So that's a good question. So um, a lot of these intermittent, oh, oh, sorry, a lot of these modified channels um, are in fact intermittent either naturally or because they have um, highly managed hydrology that leads to intermittency. So there's a lot of overlap between these issues. Um, a lot of the intermittent work that we focused on yesterday was really just looking at reference streams because we wanted to know how does intermittency alone affect our ability to interpret index scores. Um, to, in this example, we're really looking at the, I guess, the combined impact of, of flow alteration and channel modification on these systems. It's, it's all these things occurring at once. Um, I would say um, to some extent, uh, it's one, when you have a better idea of the range of conditions that you can see in modified channels, um, whether or not they're, you know, in the central valley where there aren't a ton of reference sites or, you know, intermittent streams, you'll have a better sense of like how those other factors are also limiting conditions. And so if you do set benchmarks based on the distributions that we're observing, um, those uh, impacts will already be accounted for in that approach. So that, that's one way that you can sort of tackle two birds with one stone. <laughs> I have a question for you, Rafi. <laughs> um, so this was done for Central Valley, and then there's been work done in Southern California. Do you have thoughts about statewide application on something like this to inform maybe work by Zane and others with um, those provisions underway? So this project is actually, it's a combination of two projects, one statewide, one Central Valley. Okay. And they kind of started independently. We, mer we, we merged them to sort of Make, make most effective use of the, the resources and, and questions. And so the, 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 um, the questions have evolved as we brought the, the, the state board concerns and the, the regional board concerns sort of together. Um, the Central Valley, for example, had a very strong interest in looking at specifically some of the biostimulatory factors, whereas the statewide was really originally focused primarily on biointegrity alone. So we're trying to look at both now at once on a statewide scale. At the end of the day, I think we'll, we'd, we'll have a classification system that is intended to work statewide. Um, which is, I mean, we haven't finalized it yet, where we're leaning towards that bed and bank classification system. The other two classification systems probably won't work outside the Central Valley very well. So we are trying to keep it a statewide perspective. Hi. Um, so you mentioned about uh, ASCII being high in concrete streams. So what do you think that says about uh, ASCII being useful in those areas? <laughs> um, that, that's a really good question. I think uh, it was like it's kind of a head scratcher, but I think this actually underscores how useful it can be in those channels. In these systems, the CSCI isn't going to really track well with water quality improvements but it seems that ASCII does have the potential to reflect that. So I think assessing ASCII in 
these types of systems is going to be particularly helpful for, for managers. Um, yeah, so I think it, it really emphasizes its utility. <laughs> Any last questions for Rafi? All right, let's go ahead. Oh, yep, Kyle, go for it. If there isn't a Mary, get him a mic. <laughs> if there isn't a natural reference for an entirely artificial stream, what do you think the goal should be for <laughs> management or what the, the score comes out to? Um, How do you even interpret it? I think that there's sort of two approaches to finding what's the right benchmark. One would be, you know, set it based on the best you can attain, um, and the other would be best on you've observed. And I think the science I've produced so far really answers that second part. We show what these channels can achieve, at least generically speaking. Um, I think figuring out what is attainable is ultimately going to be a, a, a site-specific case-by-case approach meaning that we might need to set site-specific objectives if we really want to reflect what those, these channels can attain. But in sh short of that, we can use these sort of existing distributions to show what is currently available out there. So I think you need to do a mixture of approach and figure out what's appropriate for that community and that location. All right, we're ready for a little break. Thank you, Rafi.